Good evening, everyone. My name is Darshan Doshi. I'm the founding director for the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Flame University. Uh, we bring to you uh, the next session, which is the 10th session of the Founders Talk series. Um, so what is Founders Talks? It's a webinar series where we bring in entrepreneurs, investors, um, business leaders, educators from around the world. Uh, who have uh, built things, have researched things, and, and really all things entrepreneurship, right? And um, what we want to do or hope to do is within a period of, say, 50 to 60 minutes, try and get uh, one or two good insights, which uh, we ourselves in our lives could uh, apply um, and in our ventures uh, to that, so that we could grow or survive or launch new ventures. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, the Flame Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation runs various initiatives. You may have read it in the Your Story article, uh, which was published last evening. Uh, so we do a few things. We run a startup accelerator program, which is equity free. Uh, this year, we will run a virtual program because of COVID-19. The applications are open. It's called the Flame Origins program. This is for startups who are revenue positive. Uh, and are looking to scale up. We have an incubator program, which is open to the students of Flame University, both undergrad and postgraduate students. The applications are open till September 20th. So if you are uh, a student, uh, an alumni, you can definitely uh, apply to that. This is so that you go from, I don't have an idea or I have an idea till uh, product development and early uh, stage or early startups. Um, and then uh, we've launched a one-year postgraduate program in entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, the applications are open. We are in the last week of the applications. August 15th is the last date. We begin the program end of this month. Um, so uh, if you or anybody you know uh, is looking for a program that can take you from, I want to grow this business, I want to launch this business, or I want to diversify the family business, uh, then this is um, this is the program for you, right? Uh, we've already exceeded the guidelines given by the national education policy that was um, uh, that was um, uh, uh, released uh, uh, a week or ten days ago. So that's something that you might want to reach out to us for. Now, moving on to today's session, uh, it's a very interesting session, and I'm very grateful uh, to Vandana for spending uh, you know her Saturday evening with us. Uh, so very quickly, uh, you know, today's topic uh, is about moving from failures to freedom, right? Um, and uh, when was the last time uh, you read uh, failure stories? When was the last time you saw on uh, television or any series or even tweets for that matter uh, about people who uh, have had their own set of failures and grown from there, right? So our media is heavily focused towards the exceptional, which is uh, overnight success, which took 10 years in the making, right? Um, there are so many entrepreneurs that are part of the Thai charter member group, right? Who have uh, built multiple businesses, many of which stories you haven't heard, but then you hear about, you know, now, you have these uh, entrepreneurs being the next unicorns or going IPO or whatnot, right? So there are very interesting stories. Not a lot of it gets uh, told. Um, but today we have Vandana who's willing to share uh, her story, her entrepreneurial journey. What are some of the lessons for it? And, and I'm extremely grateful uh, to Vandana for this. So who is Vandana, right? Let me do a quick uh, introduction. Uh, born in the UK and having lived in over 20 countries, Vandana is a chartered accountant, serial entrepreneur, OBE from the HM The Queen, uh, ex-director of the UK India Business Council, TEDx speaker, mentor and angel investor, a fellow Thai charter member. She advises ICAEW on their relationship with India and support members and students across the Indian subcontinent. She's reimagining the world as the chief alarmist of the human alarm clock. She's worked with various companies and business leaders around the world, from Credit Suisse to Mahindra's to the street cleaners of Koregao Park. 
and has been recognized on many levels for innovation and service from global institutes of repute uh, to the Indian uh, counterparts, right? Now, over to you, Vandana. You know, very curious to learn um, about what you're doing, um, what has been your journey. Um, I, I believe you do have a presentation. Feel free to share the presentation yeah. for our audience members. You can use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom. Ask as many questions as you can. She's planned for about 30 minutes of a presentation. So we'll have about 25 to 30 minutes for uh, Q&A. So we hope to make this interactive and uh, the stage is yours, Vandana. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Um, Darshan, you can see the presentation, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so first of all, thank you so much for the invite to you, Darshan, to Madhuri, to Anju. Um, and thank you to all of you who, have, uh, who are spending your Saturday evening listening to me. Uh, I hope to make it worthwhile uh, for you. The, f the first thing I think that's really important to think about is this word failure, right? Um, it's, as an Indian, right, and I count myself as an Indian even though my accent may be British, I think failure, the word failure is in our DNA, right? Because um, I, I think there are very high expectations of us from our parents, from our communities. Um, but I think it's an important thing to understand that failure is a feeling and it is a label. And because it's a feeling and a label, it can be completely dissolved and altered. Um, so when I talk to you about my failures, I am very much going to talk to you about the things that the media and society and everyone would pick up as failures. But I'm also going to tell you how they gave me incredible freedom. Um, so that, that's the aim. I hope it's going to be interesting and I'm more than happy to take questions on any aspect of what I say. So I've got my kind of 10 lessons from failure to freedom, right? So I'm gonna talk about each one in turn and, and then, you know, really over to you to, uh, to ask your questions. So this is my first one, right? Um, I don't think we know, and Darshan and I were talking about this just before the, the session um, was broadcast. Our childhoods do not define us, right? Your childhood does not define you. And what I mean by that is so many of the, um, of the holes we feel that we have inside of us have come from childhood. And I know for myself, I was uh, quite a weak child health-wise. I had asthma, I had an undiagnosed um, anxiety. I had a very authoritarian father and an amazing mother who um, with my father was very submissive. Um, and so it was a very difficult childhood. We were also living in another country. Uh, to India, we had brown skin, which meant that as children, we were teased a lot. M myself and my brother, this was back in the 70s. There was a lot of racism there. Um, and so at a very early age, you know, I was not, I, I was also, I have this crazy imagination and um, a, a crazy mind that has existed since I was a child. What, what was later diagnosed as ADHD, uh, which is attention deficit disorder, hyper, uh, hyperactive deficit disorder, which meant that I couldn't concentrate. And it, you know, at that time it wasn't diagnosed. I was told I was a very intelligent kid. My parents were told countless times, but she does not live up to her potential. And this was the big thing that was always said about me. Um, and so I always felt a failure as a child because I was desperately trying to live up to this um, this image and, and my brother who I love and I speak to literally every other day was still really close. He was the straight A student. He was the one who went to Cambridge, became a doctor, became, you know, it, da, 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 da. he's now head of uh, clinical trials for the whole of Australia and New Zealand. So you, you, you can kind of get an idea of what it was like. And so growing up, I, I felt like this failure because I wasn't living up to what everyone else thought I should be. And I was a complete misfit as well. I was not particularly popular at school and my interests were very different. And it, I think it took me, I'm 49 now, um, and I'm blessed with genes that don't make me look that old, but I am 49 and I've got no problems with saying it. And I have to say that I started dealing, you know, for most of my life, I felt a failure, right? And 
I only started dealing it with it in my 40s. I hope those of you who are in your 20s and 30s, you can take something out of this because I, um, I started doing courses and I started doing a lot of introspection. And I remember one evening, I have a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old son, a 16-year-old son, 14-year-old daughter. And I remember a couple of years ago, but maybe four or five years ago, so they were a lot younger. I remember sitting at the dining table and saying to them, you know, I've realized something about myself. And I was like, hot and cold, hot and cold. And I was saying, you know, I realize now I am a misfit. And I've had lots of challenges in my life because I'm a misfit. But my daughter looks over at me and she's, you know, eating her dinner and she goes, mommy, she goes, I'm a misfit. And I went, what? And she goes, yeah, yeah, I'm a misfit. I don't like all the things that other kids like at school. But here's the difference. In your generation, a misfit was a failure. In my generation, it's something to be admired. And I, when she said that to me, I was like, oh my God, my children teach me every day, right? Um, and I think that was the time that I started to stop being so serious with myself about, you know, how to be a success or what a success was or what a failure was. And I realized my childhood didn't de define me. I wrote a blog post um, on the human alarm clock last week that when I was a kid, I was curious about everything. And my dad used to call me Nani in a very derogatory way, right? And I used to get really offended by it, but now I'm proud of my curiosity. My curiosity is what's led me to live in so many different countries and do so many different things. So what I would say to you is your childhood doesn't define you. Whatever label you put on yourself, own it, right? I own that I'm a misfit and that's okay, right? So that's my, that's my first lesson. Uh, you know, as a child, I was told I was a failure it doesn't mean I was a failure. I certainly, looking back, I was not a failure. It's okay, right? And, and today, I will own the fact that I'm a misfit. And so to other people, they might think I should be still running. I, should, I shouldn't have sold my last company, or I should have already started my next company because it's been three years since I exited my last company. But you know what? You don't dictate the rules. I dictate the rules. It's my life. And, and just because it, it doesn't fit into your realm of possibility, that doesn't make me a failure. That's your definition, not mine. Um, so that's the first thing. Your childhood does not define you. Okay, my next, um, my next point is inspiration can come out of failure. I never wanted to be a chartered accountant, right? Never. Um, I was always doing other things, ADHD, brain, imagination. So I was always um, writing things. I used to edit the arts and entertainment pages of a newspaper when I was like 18, 19. Um, I DJed on local radio. Um, uh, and that was quite a funny story. I got this job to DJ. Somebody rang me up and said, oh, they're looking for DJs. Um, they're looking for DJs for an Indian radio station that's starting up. I, at the time, did not listen to Indian music at all, right? And this guy interviewed me and he said, so do you like Indian music? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, okay, so can you do a demo on Monday? Uh, this was on a Friday. Can you do a demo on, a mo um, on Monday of the music that you like? Because you're going to have to play Indian music on the station. And I was like, okay. So I rushed home. My flatmate was um, Indian and she loved Indian music. And so in those days, like, I, I mean, this is like 89, 90, I think. We didn't have USB sticks. We had the old cassette recorders, you know, the Walkmans. Um, and so I said to my flatmate, Priya, Priya, give me your best music. Tell me. And I wrote this massive list of all the songs that she recommended. And I put them onto this one tape. And the whole weekend, I listened to that, right? When I was doing my homework from university, when I was... Um, when I was making food, whatever I was doing, I was listening to this music. And then come Monday, I, um, I go into this studio and um, this, this guy who runs a radio station says to me, okay, so what are you gonna start with? And I said, oh, I was thinking about starting from, starting with Gayamat Se Gayamat Thak, and then I'm gonna go to, you know, this and that. And he was like, yeah, good, good. And, and so I started um, completely, like with no real knowledge, but I learned really fast. I spent a lot of time um, over the next months learning. 
Um, so much so that my show, which was the drive time show, became one of the most popular shows on the radio station. And so much so that I really didn't want to continue studying anymore. And my dad had no idea, or so I thought, that I was DJing on the radio. Mm, what I forgot was that obviously I was DJing on the radio and people might listen to it and people might pass on comments to him that, oh, we heard your daughter on the radio, which they did. So I got an irate phone call from my dad saying, what the hell are you doing? This is your final year of university. And I was like, dad, I need to have a break, this, that, and the other. And he said, nothing doing. You finish university and you are doing CA. And I really, really did not want to do it. So somehow I managed to persuade him that I would never pass these CA exams unless he gave me a year off. And I was this, you know, dutiful daughter bent down with, you know, I am a failure and I must do what my father says. Um, luckily, I don't know what possessed my dad. He said, okay, you can have a year out. So I took a year out and I had no intention of going back to, um, to starting chartered accountancy. I, um, I went and worked full time on the radio, which was great fun. And my numbers were going up. This was my first important lesson. The radio went bankrupt. The radio station went bankrupt. And it went bankrupt because although we, the numbers were going up, the advertisers were not, and, adver and radio is all about um, advertisers and um, how much they pay for the, for the radio commercials and everything. So the radio station went bankrupt. And I was devastated because this was a big failure. This had changed all my plans of what I was gonna do with my future. Um, and I went home, tail between my legs, talked to my dad and said, the radio station's gone bankrupt. And you know what my dad said to me? He said, you know, Vandana, if you had been a chartered accountant, you could have saved that radio station. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah. You know, if you understand accounting, if you understand finance, you will know how to grow the numbers. And I was sold. I was just like, oh my God, I need to do this chartered accountancy. And then I can go back and then I can buy my own radio station and run it. So out of a massive failure, which was the radio station going completely under, um, that is when I, I suddenly decided that actually chartered accountancy would be the best thing for me. And I went off and did chartered accountancy. So inspiration can come out of failure um, in that respect. My next one, um, again, is very much related to my childhood and my dad. What you rebel against may be what you need. In fact, I would go so far as to say what you rebel against is what you need. You know, my dad used to say to me as a kid, you are good for nothing, Vandana. You will never achieve anything in your life. Look at your timekeeping. Look at the way you do everything you don't. You're not methodical. You're not organized. Um, you know, and he used to always say these things to me. And I used to believe that that's who I am. And I would rebel against doing all those things, being methodical, being organized, um, organizing myself, working out what the tasks are. But you know what? Despite the differences with my dad, even now I recognize in myself that a lot, not everything, but a lot of the things that I rebel against are the things that I actually need to do. So there's a, an expression, if any of you are familiar with the Landmark Forum, which is a really powerful tool to kind of wake yourself up and get to know yourself. Um, you know, they say, whatever you resist persists. And I think, I think that's very true. Um, so again, we may think of ourselves as failures because we're not doing um, certain things. But actually, if we just take the ball by the horns and say, I'm going to change this aspect of my life, often we can. Or if we're not strong enough to do it ourselves, then especially if you're running a company, all the areas that you are weak at, you must get good team members to cover those areas. Because if you don't, then you're exposing your business to a lot of your weaknesses, right? Um, and so I think, I think that's really, really important that you, um, you accept who you are, what you are good at, and look at the things that you're not good at, look at the things that are causing you to fail, and, and really start building on those things. And if you can't do it, find somebody else who can. Okay, so that's, that's rule number three, um, or, or what I'd say about failures. The fourth is a really interesting one. When in your life are you a failure? And just because you've been given that name 
does that mean that you will always be that? And I want to give you some examples from my life. I was always doing, as you can tell, working on the radio. Um, I set up a youth club when I was 14. Um, I was always doing outlandish things. Um, and I was branded in our community as, you know, the one who's off the rails and is going to be a failure no matter what. Uh, I'd been written off before I'd even started my life, to be really honest. And, and that kind of made me even more angry and more determined to do outlandish things. So I would keep finding weird things to do, like DJing on the radio or editing a newspaper or, you know, something that wasn't what a normal Indian girl would do. And this, again, remember, was back in the 80s and um, early 90s, I'd say. Um, I, I mentioned that I set up a youth club when I was 14. Um, that was with my parents' blessing, actually, because it was for the local Hindu society in London. Um, and it was a real struggle to keep it going. And after maybe four or five years, um, I kind of gave up on it and it, it failed. When I look back now, it worked for five years. That's, that's nothing. I mean, of course, we want everything to, to last forever. But you know, how many companies actually last forever? How many, how many companies that were around 25 years ago are still out today, right? Or even five years ago. To keep something going for five years is quite an accolade, actually, especially when you're 14. But I would say today in this environment. So what constitutes a failure and who decides who gives who that label? Um, that was one of the things that I, um, that I felt very strongly about, that uh, you... you you know, people will say something's a failure because you only did it for three or four years. But the point is you did do it for three or four years and you made it a success during that period and you learned something from it. So is it really a failure? Um, another example is um, our Indian community. I do love them in the UK, but they are slightly traditional. We, we, we used to say growing up, they were frozen. So they came over from India with certain views and they kept those views and they imposed those views on us. And, and a lot of those views were great views, but we called them frozen in their views because our relatives in India had moved on and were a bit more forward thinking, but our parents were not necessarily so. So um, when I qualified as a chartered accountant and I got a bit bored and jaded by life in the UK because everything was about um, what are you gonna do next? And, what's the next promotion and are you going to buy a bigger car and are you going to get a bigger house and all of this and I was kind of a bit sick of that so I decided I wanted to do something different and I had the opportunity to move to Bucharest in Romania to um, work for Ernst & Young as a chartered accountant. When I did that back in 95-96 the whole community was in uproar and my Hindi is really bad but um, I will just do my attempt at it. It's like they were saying, Lurki Hearts and Nickel Gay. Um, and it was like, oh my God, if she'd got a job in New York or Singapore, that would have been okay. But she's gone to Bucharest in Romania. And my parents, you know, bless them. My mum was very supportive, but my dad was like, his head was down in the sand and he was so embarrassed about this. Um, I still went ahead and did it. I, I said to them that, look, you moved from India to the UK to make a better life for yourself. I'm moving from the UK to Romania, and I know you don't think that that's going to make a better life for me, but trust me, the experience is going to be amazing. They've just come out of a communist era. The Iron Curtain has just fallen. I want to see what life is like over there. I want to experience it. I want to see what's going on. Anyway, um, those so same people in the community who branded me a gambler, a risk taker, and keep her away from our kids, those are the same ones who today say, look at her, she's a trailblazer. Look at what she's achieved in her life. So, so, you know, at what point do you call yourself a failure? And at what point do you agree to disregard that, that label that's been put on you? Um, so, I mean, I decided right from the beginning, I was gonna work in Eastern Europe and I was gonna make it work and I did. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my story um, in, in the next couple of points. When I moved to Pune in 2005, um, I moved from Budapest in, in Hungary to, um, to here. And so that was 15 years ago. At that time, India was just, you know, beginning to expand with IT and everything. 
But everyone, again, in the UK and in Europe, they were like, what are you doing moving to India? What are you doing moving to this city called Pune? I mean, we've never even heard of Pune. And I'm like, so you want me to do what you think I should be doing rather than what I think I should be doing? Um, again, they all thought I was, I was mad. And even the community back in the UK who had then called me a trailblazer were now like, what's she doing? You know, and she's seven months pregnant with her second child. Um, I remember my mother-in-law saying to me, please don't have the baby in India. Um, and I said, you know what? They've got 1.2 billion people, which, they had at the which we had at that time. They know more about childbirth than most of Europe, right? So I feel safer giving birth there than I actually do in the UK. And she was quite shocked with that answer. But um, Zara, who was born back in 2005, is now a very, very healthy 14-year-old. Um, and again, People thought I was mad. Now they say that I'm visionary from having moved to Pune. Because Pune, in, in, many, um, in, in many reports that you'll have seen as well, is considered the best of the uh, tier two cities, right? And is almost up at tier one. So, I mean, you know, whether, whether I made the right choice or not, it's just interesting to see how people think I gambled one day. But because the gamble has paid off, I'm now respected. Uh, so that was another example of this. Uh, another, uh, another example was with the High Commission. I, was, uh, I had set up the British Business Group here in Pune, which was uh, a forum for Indians and British people to meet together and look at how they could expand business. And I remember back in 2007 or 2008, I made a bid for the, or, or I asked the High Commission to make a bid to get the Lord Mayor of the City of London to come to Pune. And uh, I had somebody at the High Commission who said, why on earth would he come to Pune? I mean, of all the cities in India, why would he come? And I just rattled off, you know, in terms of it, fastest growing um, city with IT outside of the tier one cities. HSBC has their global software development center, WNS, um, which provides a lot of services to the UK is based here too. It's their, you know, global headquarters, etc. And I rattled it off and he just looked at me and dismissed me. Um, Sure enough, the, the Lord Mayor of the City of London did, did not come that year. But interestingly, the year after, the Lord Mayor himself asked if he could come to Pune. So, you know, just because somebody thinks you're doing something wrong at one stage, that you, you gotta, you've got to have that conviction in you. Just, just don't bother fighting them, but just keep going on your path um, and, and they will see what it's worth. And, I think the last thing I'd like, you, like to leave you with on this slide is um, somebody who calls you a failure says more about them than it does about you. And you all, always must remember that. It must mean that they have a very limited mindset if they're calling you a failure um, because they're not you. They don't know what you're going through. And people will always have an opinion. You have to decide whether it's worth the breath to listen to it. I would say maybe not. Okay, uh, next one. Growth comes from outside your comfort zone. This is, um, this is really uh, a key one. I, I think all growth comes from outside your comfort zone. And a couple of examples I want to give you um, about real failures here. When I moved to Romania, I was at that time a failure because I understood UK accounting. Um, I understood how things worked in the UK. What I didn't understand was hyperinflation, and Romania was hyperinflationary at that time. And what I didn't understand was Romanian accounting law, which was the way that they did their accounting. So I was kind of like a complete misfit. I did not understand anything that they were doing there. And um, Romanian accounting law was very, very much based on the communist system of, do we have enough employment for our people? Not about profitability, nothing that Western companies look at. And I, I totally failed at understanding that for the first couple of months. And I was trying to convince everyone, look, the way we do things in the West is so much better. Um, to which, you know, they just ignored me and said, you know, you're a bit of an imperialist. Um, and then slowly I realized that what I was saying was right, but they didn't understand why it was right. So I started to try and explain to them, you know, do you want investment? coming from the UK or the US? Do you need money in your organization? Yes, I do. Okay, 
So they won't understand your accounts. Do you agree? Oh, why not? And then I would do a quick comparison to show them how we, we did accounting in, in the UK, for example. And, and then they would say, okay, so what do we need to do? And I had to find a middle ground because the UK was not gonna cut it. But there was this new thing coming out, and this was back in 95, 96, called International Accounting Standards. So the accountants amongst you will know IFRS. This was the precursor to IFRS. And at that time, it was really not known in the world very much. Um, and I realized that I was gonna fail completely if I only learned Romanian accounting. And I was gonna fail completely if I kept pressing about UK accounting. But this international thing could be a good bridge. And so I taught myself from textbooks what this accounting was about. And then I started teaching everyone else. So suddenly I went from this failure imperialist to this woman who actually understands what's going on. And I became really, really successful at it. So successful that um, I decided to leave Ernst & Young and set up my own training entity. And, uh, and I got loads and loads of clients and myself and my colleague Mike built it up to, um, to quite a large size within one year, which is why we then got bought out by a listed company uh, back in 98, I think it was when I was 27. And what they did was they asked me to open the international division. Um, so, so the growth came from me thinking or me, me realizing that I couldn't do what they needed and then taking a step back and saying, can I be a bridge and do something that is needed? And then altering what I was doing to make something work. So I hope, I hope that makes sense. When I left Ernst & Young to set up the training entity, a lot of people thought uh, that it was gonna fail. How could I do that? I was a Brit in Romania, spoke the language reasonably well, but you know, could I actually set this up? Not really sure. So, um, but again, proved them wrong by just not concentrating on what they were saying, but concentrating on what our clients needed and then providing that service. Um, I, I talked about becoming the international, um, uh, becoming the CEO of the international division. So once I'd sold, which was then a listed company on the UK stock exchange, they set up an international division and asked me to run it. So I had to very quickly go from running one entity in one country to going to many countries and opening entities, finding staff, finding the legal structure for each of those countries, et cetera, et cetera. And very naively, I thought this would be very easy to do because I'd done it in Romania. Um, I realized very quickly it was not very easy to do. It almost failed many times in different countries. But, but what saved me, I think, each time was net finding people who could do what I couldn't do. So who had the expertise that I didn't. So, um, the reason there's a work in progress sign in the corner of this slide is because these were failures waiting to happen, but I was work in progress on those failures. So I managed to turn them around. Not, not all the time. Um, we expanded very quickly and I wasn't watching our costs enough. And so we ended up with racking up a lot of um, a lot of costs and creating a huge loss, which was a real concern for the listed company. So someone was brought in on top of me. Um, I sulked for a month or two months, then realized this guy actually had a lot of knowledge and I learned a lot from him. And over the course of the next five years, I built up that division to being an extremely profitable division with a lot of scope. Um, so again, you know, sometimes someone coming in above you, someone coming in um, on the side telling you how to do things, it's worth understanding the environment. If, if I hadn't listened to him, I think I would have ended up leaving the company or the company would have gone down. Um, so, so I think that was quite a humbling lesson for me. Um, so all examples there, they weren't, they ended up not being failures because I was work in progress and I was determined to not make them failures. Okay, six, if your customers don't understand it, you don't understand them. Uh, the example that I wanna give here is, is just one. I thought when I moved to India, I, I wanted to open a company that 
could provide really good quality education because I believe that India was a nation um, of a billion entrepreneurs that could become a billion Tatas and Mahindras and Infosys's, but with the right kind of education. And I felt that it started with accountancy education. So the Indian CA is a fantastic qualification. However, if you could add to that a bit more of strategy, or if you could create um, other accountants who could just help small businesses understand profits and losses, et cetera, et cetera, um, it, it would make life a lot easier and we'd see a lot more growth. So very naively, I came to India and said, right, I'm gonna open a company that produces really good textbooks um, that really explain the ABC of accounting um, in a way that helps businesses. And so I picked a couple of international qualifications and, and said, let's start writing books for these qualifications. Now, my old company, BPP, had been doing that, but BPP was a pre, like a premier uh, pr provider of, of books and of tuition. And I wanted to do something that really started at a basic level and was much more easier to understand. Um, I completely avoided thinking about the fact that I was going up against two billion dollar companies. So BPP was one, Kaplan was the other, right? And they both are big players in this market. And naively I thought, you know, come on, we can do this. So I came to Pune, I set up this, um, gave birth to my daughter Zara in December and then um, set up uh, get through guides and we produced a, a pretty high class product but we decided to price it really low and that was one of our fundamental mistakes because our customers were all why would we if you're that cheap you can't be good so therefore we're not going to buy you or those that did buy us were immediately looking for the holes in what we did and even though we didn't have, or we had probably the same number of mistakes as a BPP or a Kaplan textbook did, because we were the cheap provider, you know, it was all out everywhere about the mistakes in our books, whereas people didn't tend to talk about the other ones. So, so that was really a horrible lesson to say that, you know, our customers didn't understand what we were trying to do. They couldn't believe that there could be a company out there that was trying to produce something that was high quality at a low price because it doesn't work or it didn't work back then. We're talking about between 2007 and 2010 and that was the time of the financial crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that, was, that was a really major learning for me. Um, I did not understand my customer. And as a result, I, I really blew that opportunity, I think. Um, in the first year because we we didn't change the pricing. We just tried to prove that we were good. We did build a following and we built a, quite a strong following, which was, um, which was great, but it wasn't enough to sustain us against $2 billion companies, right? So we had lots of difficulties during that phase. Um, we raised money, we put the money into it, we put the money into advertising and stuff, but, but it still... It was too difficult because we were fighting in a market that, that didn't really exist. You don't have high class products at a low price. And we couldn't get that message out to the market. So I take full responsibility for that. I think that was a big, um, that was a big no, no. And I think, um, you know, here, here's another one. I hired the, the wrong people for the right reasons and I hired the right people for the wrong reasons. And I'm gonna give you an example. And, and by this, I, please understand, I don't mean any disrespect to the people that I'm gonna talk about because I am one of them now, right? And you'll understand what I mean. When I came to India, um, when I saw how difficult it was for women who had children to get jobs, um, I wanted to do something for them. So I ended up recruiting and 90% of my office were women who had children and who couldn't find or weren't doing um, high powered jobs because their husbands were often doing high powered jobs and they were looking for something that was gonna stimulate their brains but not necessarily put pressure on them. So they were great at writing this material that I needed but were they really competitive? Would they alter? Would they stay late? 
to get something done on a regular basis? The answer was no, because that's not what they looked for the job for. So I hired the wrong kind of people for the right reasons. I wanted women with Hey, Vandana, you're on mute. I think we just lost you. For Apologies. Yeah, my, um, my uh, electricity just died. Okay. So, <laughs> apologies. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, so going back to hiring people for um, uh, hiring the wrong people for the right reasons. I, I didn't realize exactly what kind of person I would need. And what I should have done was make changes to the team. So I had, uh, you know, both types of people. But um, unfortunately, uh, I didn't make that decision. So, you know, I think the important thing that I say is that it's really important that you think about who you need in the team. And if you need to make, if you need to make changes, then you should make those changes. I think I waited too long to make those changes. Uh, Darshan, I, I take it you can't see the presentation. That's right. I was just going to. Okay, uh, I, I'm just going to. I'm just going to put it back on. Sorry. Thanks a lot. Give me a second. Apologies. Um, right, here we go. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, um, very quickly then, um, hiring the right people for the wrong reasons. We did hire some really expensive, great salespeople. But what we didn't have was enough budget to support them in advertising and marketing. So sometimes when you get the right people and you don't have enough resources to support them to do their job, they're not going to be able to do their job. And that was one of the big challenges that I think we had um, was that we had some really good people, but we didn't have enough funding at that time to be able to spend like we should have been able to spend on advertising against two two billion dollar companies right um so hiring the right people for the, the wrong reasons or the right wrong people for the right reasons is not a good idea um all right moving on if you can't breathe the market then uh there's no oxygen in your business what what do i mean by this what i mean is um you have to understand the business cycles, every aspect of the business cycle. When we came to India to set up the business in, in publishing, we thought we publish the books and then we sell the books and we, we get the money in. And that, that is true, but we didn't think enough about the cycle. If you think about it, you've got to write everything first, which means money out. Then you've got to be advertising it, which means money out. Then you get it into bookshops, which means your stock is in somebody else's possession and to print that stock money out. And then they will pay you in three months time money out, right? We did not realize the breadth of that cycle. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't understand that, and even though I'm a chartered accountant and I had a number of accountants you know, with me, we didn't do enough sensitivity analysis that what if we don't get enough sales? What if the books take too long to write, et cetera, et cetera. So there was this one point where I was just looking at this cash deficit, thinking, oh my God, I'm going to go bankrupt before we even get a single sale. So at that time, that's when your um, instinct for survival kicks in. And at that time, I realized that a lot of people that I was speaking to were saying, hey, these books are good, but can you do training to supplement these books? And I hadn't thought about doing training at that time at all. I just thought about producing these books. But I realized with training, it's actually money in really fast. So very quickly, we set up a training division 
And we went out to some of the market leaders that we knew would need our training, companies like Genpact and Credit Suisse. We quickly got to know the right people and um, we got some proof of concept very, very early on, which gave us the cash to be able to keep the other side of the business going. So we were breathing the market for training as well as breathing the market now for the publishing side. Um, and if we hadn't done that so quickly, Vandana would not be sitting here in front of you today and I would be probably still in a corner, look, gazing at my navel, just wondering what went wrong. Um, but you, you, you have to be breathing all the time and breathing adjacent markets to the market that you're in to understand how it's gonna impact your business. Okay, that's eight, nine, failures can be stepping stones. Oh gosh, the biggest one for this was when we lost. So we, we had an accreditation from ACCA, which is one of the global accountancy bodies. Um, and when we came in with that accreditation, we were the upstart in the industry because the only two people who had accreditations were those $2 billion companies. And suddenly this tiny company from India comes in and has an accreditation. Um, we should have raised more funding early on so that we could really compete. But I was scared of diluting control. I was scared of what could happen um, to the business. I was also going through a lot of personal difficulties at that time. I was going through a divorce. I had young children. A lot of our training was going really well. Um, and I made some bad calls on raising finance. I should have raised more finance to be able to compete with those companies. We didn't. And at ACCA, um, brought in a rule that to apply for the accreditation, you would have to put a deposit down. And when you got the accreditation, you would have to pay them a lump sum every year. And we were just not big enough to do it. So we lost the accreditation. And that was devastating because half of our company was, was really supporting that, that qualification. However, stepping stones do come out of it. What was really interesting was adjacent industries had seen the material that we'd produced. And an adjacent industry that had seen our material was the insurance industry here in India. So it's the Insurance Institute of India. Somebody had given them some of our materials and they really liked our materials. And around the time that we lost our accreditation, I got a phone call from the Secretary General of the Inst Insurance Institute of India. And he said, oh, I understand you do materials, um, would you be interested in doing, could you do something for us? And I was really honest with him. I said to him, our expertise is accountancy, but if you're willing to give me six weeks, I will get a team together and I will do this because our expertise beyond accountancy is being able to produce really good material really fast. And he said, yep. And so we got a small team together through friends of friends, and we produced a prototype book, which they absolutely loved. And over the next five years, the Insurance Institute of India became our biggest customer. And I'm really proud to say that even though we didn't get the revenue, see, we were paid a fixed sum for the work that we did for them. Over a million people in India were using our textbooks. And so that was really gratifying to see that there was something that we did that actually went to a wider audience than we first thought. So I think failures can be stepping stones if you learn from those failures and then say, okay, it didn't work here. Could it work somewhere else? Um, I think that that works. I've realized that I'm completely out of time. So I'm gonna do these last two very quickly. Sorry, um, Darshan. Um, I think I got a bit carried That's away. You've got a few questions as well, which we didn't Okay, get so let me just do these last two. And they're fairly straightforward. Your definition of success cannot be based on other people's validation. If it had, I would have committed suicide when I was 14 years old, right? Um, the point is everyone and their dog is gonna have an opinion about success. What you have to do is define what success is for you, right? And once you define it, you need to build a tribe around you who also believe in that definition of success. And please do not believe that becoming a unicorn um, or a, having a billion dollar valuation is success. You know what? If you're an oil company and you have 
a, a trillion dollar valuation, I don't care. You are not good for this world, right? So I think it's time to make our own definitions of success. And for me, as long as I am um, following my, my core values, which are belonging, contribution, and gratitude, as long as I'm making people smile, as long as I'm inspiring people to do better than they did yesterday, then for me, that is my definition of success. I've been working on my next venture for the last 10 years, right? Uh, full time for three years. And before that, I was working kind of in my head in the evenings. Um, it may well turn out to be a multi, multi million dollar venture. Um, and with the current negotiations with what's going on with it, it, it may well become that. But that's not my, my definition of success. My definition is being able to support other people. Um, so that's the 10. And the last one that I just wanna say is you cannot hope to lead others if you cannot lead yourself. So you need to do some deep introspection on yourself, on what is really important to you. Are you willing to stand up to others on certain things and only then go forward? If you're gonna be swayed every time you speak to somebody else, then, then you're not leading yourself and you can't hope to lead other people. So with that, I'm gonna end. Um, Darshan, I'm gonna stop this presentation sure. and we can... Uh... Wonderful, um, excellent Vandana. Uh, I just jotted down some thoughts as you were speaking, which I just want to recap in the next uh, 20 to 30 seconds. Love the authenticity, right? Uh, no exaggeration to the point. Um, and there are many aspiring entrepreneurs over here, uh, many existing entrepreneurs, business leaders over here. So uh, here are my takeaways from this talk so far, right? Clarity of thought, know who you are. And that is a big part and that is the starting point. Who you are, what are your beliefs, what are your assumptions? Uh, the next one is uh, constraints, you know, or things that are holding us back. There are many, many things which could be either in our head or they can be uh, physical uh, resource constraints, right? That doesn't need to, you can overcome them with determination, uh, with clarity and by asking some help, right? You've had a lot of people help you along your way. Uh, have conviction and commitment. You know, and uh, there's one course that uh, we've, uh, uh, we've, we'll be running in the one year program, uh, PGPEI called effectuation. And in effectuation, essentially it helps answer. Um, I, I am interested in this idea, but how do I have conviction and commitment to this idea? So going from, uh, oh, I love, I think this is a great business idea to work on to uh, this is my focus, this follows under my uh, priority for the next two to three years, right? I think that is very, very critical to get that conviction and commitment in what you do. Growth mindset, and you and I have yeah. talked a lot about yeah. this, uh, an entrepreneurial mindset. In everything that you did, I always saw or heard uh, growth mindset and an entrepreneurial mindset. You know, the ability to do things and make things. In effectuation, you know, one of the principles also is pilot in the plane. I heard you say mm. this uh, word, right? I take full responsibility for this failure. You know, this means a lot of ownership. Uh, it also is a thing that you're saying to yourself, if I don't work, nothing will work, right? So being the pilot in the plane and being the person who guides it forward, right? I think that those were some of my takeaways. We have a few questions. I'm just going to walk them through very quickly. Um, we might not go through all the questions, but let's try and take a few of them at least. Here's Sadashiv Nayak. The scale of failure or its opposite success seem to include outliers, uh, outlier events, including some of the examples you have nicely explained. But there's a lot of in between, especially in a large nation like ours. How often, uh, what often gets termed mediocre, average, ordinary, uh, how should one approach the scale of failure for this majority who's, who lies in between? Uh, so, so are we, so correct me if I'm wrong, Darshan, um, uh, Sadashiv is basically saying that lots of people will consider something a failure and how do you deal with that? Is that... So you have failure, which may be a large failure and a yes, large yes. success, yes, but yes. there's a lot of thing in between, which is mediocre or average or ordinary. You know, one of the things uh, yeah. people don't look up to is mediocrity. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. So maybe uh, I'll just broaden the question and say, can you speak a little bit about how do you look at mediocrity uh, or being average or ordinary um, with respect to huge successes or huge failures? No, I, you know, again, um, I, I'm a real believer in these are labels. These are labels that we put on things. For me, um, whoever you are and whatever you've been through, if you can look at what you've done and learn from it, and next time take it one step further, then, then you're, you're not mediocre at all. You're actually a success, right? So it, it goes back to growth mindset. I don't think, I, I think we've been brainwashed um, by the media and by society into these polarized success and failure. And actually, there is no such thing as success and failure, right? So like I said, a, an oil company for me is a failure because they're, they're creating a, a, a climate where my children may not be able to have children, right? That's, that's a truth and we have to accept that. So what I would say to you is for me, don't look at those words. In, 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 inspire yourself to think of yourself in other ways um, and, and, and learn from wherever you are. That's what I'd say. Great answer. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, just to add on it, uh, I think uh, each and every micro step or a small step matters, right? So it's just about showing up to work uh, mm. and taking the next step, right? And keep moving along. There'll be some days where you'll be energized and you'll actually do five things. There'll be days where you just don't, can't move and still, you know, you're just taking the next step forward. And I think having the discipline and the answer to that kind of goes to why am I doing this? Yeah. What is the purpose? What do I hope to achieve? What, and, and it's got more internal than the external parameters, right? So uh, just building on, on what you said. Yeah. Um, Kiran Deshpande asked this question. Um, if you have failures repeated one after another, should you hold the fort and for how long? Yeah, God, that's a hard one. You know, I've never um, regretted shutting something down. I've regretted not shutting it down fast enough, right? So I, I, think, I think what happens is we often become um, so blinkered that I have to keep going, I have to keep going. I think this is the time when you need to find a mentor or an advisor um, or, or a few people who can be objective with you about what's going on. Um, and I think that's why having organizations like Flame having Thai, um, which is the Indus entrepreneurs that you and I and Kiran are part of, you know, where you can find people who understand business, who can say to you, hey, it's not going to work if you keep like this. Um, you keep going like this. I think that's absolutely essential. And I think having advisors sooner rather than later is, is also a good idea. Um, you know, there are times, some of the things that I've done in my life, even the human alarm clock at the moment, it's slightly ahead of its time, right? It, you know, I wake people up, I get disrupt thoughts and not everyone's ready for that, but they're a hell of a lot more ready today than they were 10 years ago. So, you know, your failure might be a failure now, but it may be a success in, in a little while. So you need some other people to help calibrate and help you get your judgment there. Excellent. Uh, here's a question from Jayshree. Mm. How does one handle a situation where the credit of one's hard work is served on a platter to someone else? Oh, Jayshree, what I would say is this is unfortunately life. And uh, what I would say is you've got to continue being who you are. And if you've really done something that's really good, even if somebody else has taken credit for it, you keep doing what you're doing and people will notice and people will, um, you know, I've seen this time and time again in my life where, where others have taken credit for things that I've done. But because I keep doing what I'm doing, over time people have seen that it was actually me, right? So, so that's one thing. Is it worth making a fuss? No. Is it worth going and talking to that person to understand why? Yes. But in a way where you're not, you're not being confrontational, uh, perhaps, I need to understand more about the situation, but there are ways to, to kind of handle that situation. Excellent. All right. This is going to be the last question because we are at six, uh, but this is an important one. Uh, this comes from Siddharth. 
how do you rebuild yourself after you have hit the rock bottom? Um, and just for some context, we mm. had invited Dr. Ashwin Nayak, who runs mm. a mental illness or mental mm. health startup. Mm. Uh, and he talked a lot about it. So Siddharth, you might want to watch that video as mm. well. But Vandana, you've gone through a lot of highs and lows mm. and you walked us uh, through your story. How, how do you pick up yourself after you've uh, hit the rock bottom? Um, it, you know, that is such a good question because I've been through some pretty dark days. And, um, you know, the only person who can get you out of it is you, right? So what I've always done, done is I've gone internal and I've accepted that I'm at rock bottom. I haven't surrendered. I've accepted. This is where I am. This is what's happening at this moment. Now what? Right? Take a deep breath and say, now what? And then I go back to what are my fundamentals? What are, what are the things that I, I care about most in this world? And I don't mean the people that I care about. What, what values make me me? And, and like I said to you, belonging, contribution, and gratitude are my three key ones that keep me going. And I build on that. So for example, Siddharth, at no joke, every day I write a gratitude uh, journal. And in that gratitude journal, it's not just saying, oh, I'm so grateful for the beautiful flowers, right? It will be an incident that happened the day before, and it will be, what did I learn from that, right? And I'll put three things down that I learned from it. And just that action every day has helped me balance. And the other thing that you have to know, Siddharth, if you are at rock bottom, there is only one way up. Yeah, and get for, ask for help. Get yes. help. Yes. You know, there are yeah, yeah, people yeah. who are there to help, right? Uh, yeah. Use use the help. You have to depend on yourself. You have to get yourself out of it for sure. Uh, but don't hesitate to ask for help. There's nothing wrong with that. So um, we're at six oh three. We've gone a little overboard today, uh, oh, but it has been an absolutely phenomenal session. Uh, Vandana, thanks a lot for your time. Um, it was amazing to hear your story. Um, hope uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, get more of your time in the coming months. Of course, of and, course. Um, looking Love forward to, to your uh, book that is coming out as well. Yeah, actually, just two things very fi finally. Um, the Human Alarm Clock, I'm on LinkedIn. So, and I'm always putting up articles that will get you to think uh, about things. And on Facebook, I've got the Ojas Chronicles. It's a fictitious story about a girl who discovers exactly what is encoded inside her. So if you're looking to find out, you know, I don't know what's inside me, it's worth following that because um, her story is your story and hopefully you'll get something out of it. Excellent. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us. Just a quick announcement. Uh, we have a session uh, next Wednesday. Um, Anju, could you just pull up the slide if that's all right? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, being financially savvy um, is, is really, really important for any startup, right? Uh, right from the early days, from the ideation days, you need to have clarity. Um, Vandana spoke about, you know, being better prepared financially uh, for one of her startups. So uh, I've known Sujata for a long time um, and she's absolutely phenomenal. She has worked a lot with some of our startup from the Flame Origins program. Um, her uh, sessions were really well received right from financial projections to uh, when to take funding, how to take funding, how to structure it. Um, so in this session, she's going to speak a little bit about um, you know, why you need to have, what kind of financial knowledge you should have uh, and some examples of people who have some financial knowledge, how has their startups uh, been able to um, grow rapidly. So that's on Wednesday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Join us, register for the session. These sessions are open for everyone. Uh, you can ask uh, anyone to, uh, anyone who you know could benefit from this session to join in. All right, Vandana, have a great weekend. Thanks a lot for joining us and uh, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Darshan. Thank you, team at Flame. Bye. Thank you, Anju. Thank you, Madhuri.